Hey, Five Finance family, and welcome to this edition of Let's Talk Tuesday. So on this edition of Let's Talk Tuesday, we're going to keep with the theme of um, financial literacy because it is still Financial Literacy Month, um, the month of April, all month long. And so I wanted to make sure that I talked about something that I feel is important to a lot of us, um, and that is real estate. And so since I am not a subject matter expert on this particular um, genre of financial literacy, I wanted to make sure that I brought a guest on who is a subject matter expert who can definitely give us some tips and some guidance in the real estate um, investment and real estate purchasing arena. And so I wanted to make sure that we give a warm welcome, Five Finance family. Like, I want to hear, see some hand clappings. I want to see some yay emojis or something like that. But we want to make sure we welcome Brandon Baines. He is the owner and the CEO of It's Already Sold Real Estate here in the greater Atlanta area. Um, and so we want to bring him on. Brandon does have a tagline. And so I wanted to make sure that I said Brandon's tagline before I brought him on. Um, it is building relationships one home at a time. And so um, as you can hear from his tagline, he's very passionate about this. And so we want to bring him on so he can share with us um, some good tips on real estate investing and real estate purchasing as a whole. So let's welcome Brandon Baines, Five Finance Family. So Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Murray, for bringing me onto your show. Um, I'm just blown uh, away by your invitation. Yeah, we're so excited to have you here. I think everybody can hear you. Can everybody hear Brandon okay? Can somebody give me thumbs up if you can hear us okay, please? All right, great. Okay, so Brandon, um, welcome to the show. I want you to kind of give a brief background um, about your business, um, your passion, especially because I like to focus on passion when I talk to business owners. Um, and just tell us like how you got started and why you do what you do. Yes. So my passion is actually um, helping, um, you know, less minority or um, underserved communities get into purchasing a home due to the fact that there's just right now all the rents in the big industries are buying up homes. So I just really want to make home ownership reasonable within every American family. Um, that is my true goal. Um, I got into real estate because I had a passion for helping. I watched a movie uh, when I was young that kind of involved us um, actually taking care of property management and seeing how community works and understanding how home ownership helps build the community led me into getting into real estate. And my passion just drive from me selling homes to understand how those homes transitioned into changing the community from your community um, schooling districts to your actual government, as well as the actual business that comes into the community. So once I understood how real estate played a whole, um, how serious it was and how important it was to our communities, I was like, well, if I can teach everybody to understand how important real estate is and how they can utilize that, that house to leverage financial freedom, I was like, I'm all in for it. And that's how I kind of got into it. Well, that's dope. Um, we definitely hear since we're about building wealth, I totally get the whole um, financial freedom aspect of it. That's the same thing that I try to tell my clients. Like, that's what I try to drive home. And I definitely use tax strategies, um, budget planning, things of that nature so that we can reach that goal together because it's all about community. So I love that you mentioned that to community because that's a big thing. Um, that I support as well. So that's great. So now that we have a brief background on your passion, um, how you kind of got into the real estate game, um, I want to ask you some questions that are going to be tailored around like the home buyer process. So um, our five finance family, you know, some of them may already have a home. Some people may be thinking about purchasing a home. And so I want you to kind of walk us through that process. So I'm going to ask a few questions um, so that we can get your insight on what would be um, our options and I guess how we can move forward 
um, in certain situations. So the first question that I get from a lot of clients is, um, what is a debt to income ratio? And then why is that important when I'm considering purchasing a home? It's great that you asked that question. So debt to income ratio is probably one of the most important elements that you need to understand when you're purchasing a home. Because so let's understand what debt is. That is the stuff that you actually owe. So when a lender looks at your file or you're trying to purchase a house, they're going to look at all your debt. So your student loan debt, they're going to look at what your car payment is, what your minimum payments are on your credit cards. And then they're also going to factor in your income. One thing that we cannot fix or change is your income. That's going to be a, a steady line. So some people might think like, hey, I work overtime. I can add that into my income because I might be getting, you might get 10 hours or 20 hours a week of overtime every week for a year. But that's technically not considered as usable income. And a lot of people get that misconception like, okay, I'm getting overtime and I can use that as an income stream, but it's actually technically not true. So knowing that what your income is is exactly what it is. It's if I make $40,000 a year, they're going to base it off of me making $40,000 a year. And so with your debt, you have to know how much utilization you can use in order for you to purchase a house. So a lender always compiles it by what you call a front end and a back end ratio. Okay. So your front end ratio is more guideline to like what your natural debt is going to be. So you're talking about your car, your credit card debt, your student loan debt. That's going to be what your front end, all the debt you already naturally incur. And then when you go into your back end, that's going to be more added towards when you're purchasing your house, how much is that mortgage going to be? Also, what your insurance is going to be, all the factors that include to your debt to income, um, that you, your total debt when you purchase a house. And that's how they're going to equate how much your, your purchase power is. So most lenders do not like to go high on DTI. Right. So most of them, if you're going to go into conventional, they're probably going to be looking at a 43 to 45 percent, whereas FHA may go up to a higher about 50 percent, up to about 55 percent. But that's a really maxed out DTI, so you're going to have to make some really great income. But that's typically what you're looking at in your ratios. And it's a real simple process. You just calculate all your bills divided by your income and you'll get your DTI ratio. Right. And I am so glad that you mentioned that again. We talked about that briefly on a previous live about your credit utilization. Right. Um, because I know that that does play a big factor. I mean, we accumulate all these things, especially in the African-American community. I feel like we love to accumulate things. And, <laughs> and sometimes to our detriment, right? Um, and so it's very important. I, I love that you drove that home. Like, hey, just because you're making overtime to pay for these things, that's not going to be something that they're going to consider when they're calculating your DTI. So thank you so much for uh, driving that home to our five finance um family and if you see me like jotting down and looking down it's because i'm taking those two five finance families so y'all might want to get a pen and a pad make sure y'all take notes okay so um thank you for explaining to us what dti is um the next question that i want to ask is about student loans now i read somewhere that americans um have about 17.1 trillion dollars in student loan debt okay um, and that to me is crazy, but I want to know, like, what are your options when you have student loans, um, as far as purchasing a home? Cause it sounds like it's included in my debt to income ratio. That is correct. So your, okay. um, your debt to income ratio is, is your student loans going to be included in it. And so what, um, most people try to tell you is that you, so say for instance, you have a $100,000 um, student loan debt. Well, you have to take 1% if you do not have a payment plan set up for your debt to income ratio. So say for instance, my student loan is $100,000, I would take 1% of that. That's gonna be $1,000 that's gonna count against my income. That's gonna mm -hmm. be considered as debt. But as, a, as an individual, if you say for instance, you have already kind of talked to your student loan um, lender and you said, hey, I'm gonna pay you $500 a month and that payment plan is actually either on the books or actually showing in your credit report, then they'll use that $500 instead of that, that 1% rule to to um, perform okay. against your debt. So that's a way that a lot of people can use, or you can like kind of renegotiate your 
student loan debt and kind of say, hey, can I get a cheaper payment? And if I reconcile my cheaper payment to a lower um, lower payment, then that means that can help you get some more income added towards your, your purchase power. Right. Okay. That's good to know. I okay. never knew that about the percentage allocation. Never knew that. So you definitely schooled me in that arena. Okay. So now that we touched on the student loan and we also talked about our DTI, what if I'm a person who doesn't have like stellar credit, right? Like it's not great, but it's not horrible. Like what are my options? That's great that you asked that question. I mean, that's like, so as you know, like income, I told you is one thing you can't fix, but credit is something that's supposed to be broken and fixed. It goes up and down, it fluctuates. Right. So credit's very easy. Um, what you wanna know is, you try to get your utilization down as uh, much as possible, but they do understand that you go through life. So when you're thinking about your credit, you want to make sure that you're always trying to make all of your minimum payments as much as possible because good payment history helps you to get into a home. You can also do things like piggyback. So say, for instance, you have a... Uh, a brother, sister, mother that has great credit on a credit profile, maybe an American Express. Mm -hmm. And you actually say, hey, can, and you don't, and that's why I tell, I tell people, like, you don't have to stay at the card. You just need to be on the credit. So you can talk to your, your cousin, sister, brother, and be like, hey, can I get on that credit card? I just need it so that I can get a higher, um, actually get my DTI lower, because now I got more, less utilization on my credit report. Right. So it helped make my credit report a lot better. But also, it would also give me the advantage point of actually utilizing that credit card to say I have more credit history and with better credit history helps the lender to make a better solidified decision. Now, some lenders can see that it, you are utilizing somebody else's credit, but they don't know to the extent. So they, they can still utilize that as qualify. And so that's a good way to kind of get more credit. And as you use that time, maybe three to six months, you can actually probably apply for different credit cards that can help you build or segue yourself into getting better um, credit history. Okay. I love that you said piggyback and I'm going to um, ask you a follow up questions, but I wanted to make sure that I told my five finance family, hey, guys, if you are tuned in, right, you're watching, we're going to open up um, the platform so you guys can ask questions to Brandon um, before we end this live. So I know you have some comments, questions coming in, but we're going to hold them all until after the live. So, Brandon, going back to the piggyback theory, right? Um, would you mm -hmm. say that when you're piggybacking on someone's card, that it should be a card that has like a long history of credit? Like, does that help you any anymore or does it matter? Yes. Long okay. history matters. Like, you don't want to piggyback off of, you know, somebody that just opened up a credit card three, six months ago. You want right. You want somebody that has some great history. You're typically looking for years because that's what the banks and the lenders are going to be looking for is how right. long have they had this credit. So okay. years and payment history. Don't jump on somebody and they got they can't pay the card, their credit card payment on time because right. it's just going to make it you you're reflecting exactly what they do. All um, right. And that's why I try to tell people like I don't try not to touch their credit cards. So you don't want to utilize it because you want them to adjust their billing based off of how they live their life. And, you know, some people are a little nervous about allowing people to use their piggyback and um, right. with their credit card. But there's actually companies out here that do sell their credit cards for a substantial fee. But I try to tell everybody, you know, try to use your family if you can. Wow. I didn't know that that was a business. So companies sell their credit cards for a fee. Mm -hmm. There's there's people out here that will maybe might let you utilize that credit card for might be two three hundred dollars. It can go up. I mean, depending mm -hmm. on how much credit you're talking about, how much right. utilization. Yeah, it, there's a, there's companies out here. Wow. Where people say that. Mind blowing. Wow. Okay, so we talked about DTI. We talked about credit. We talked about our student loans. So if I am ready to make that jump, I'm ready to buy a home. Like, what's my first step? What's the first thing that I should do in order to prepare for that home buying process? So the first step I tell everybody to do is you first want to talk to a lender and okay. you want to you want to give them all your information. Um, I recommend and this is how I explain it to every cus customer that I speak to or 
as I consult with them, as I explain them, this is the steps. So your lender is like your attorney. You tell them everything and nothing but the truth because <laughs> they are going to find out every single thing. So right. they're like the most important person in this faction because you need the loan. And right. that's what makes it work. So the more information you give a lender, that's going to be the best advice you're going to do because he can structure the deal in the start. Okay. Because structuring is what all lending is about. It's pretty much how can I leverage this consumer into a purchase in a house based off the information they have and that they have provided me. So mm -hmm. I know there's been situations where I've actually been in a deal where somebody was, a, a, in a he owned his own LLC, he mm -hmm. dissolved his LLC and wind up not being able to purchase a house because once they pulled the information and he had pay stubs and everything, once they looked up the LLC and the Secretary of State, because they will check, mm -hmm. they found out that his company was dissolved and they would not approve him for a loan. Wow. So, and that's through your underwriter. So your MLO is your attorney, the underwriter is your judge and jury. So they make wow. the final decision on whether they're gonna approve your house or not. Right. And right. a good segue to understand why they ask you for all this documentation is be the lender, your MLO, which is your mortgage loan originator. He's on the hook for the first year. So really? he has to pay back any, com yep. He has to pay back all commission that he made within that house within the first year. So if a origination fee is one or two percent, he has to pay that one or two percent fee back. The wow. the mortgage underwriter is on the hook for three years and they can lose their license. They do not get paid any additional fees. They don't make anything. So uh, the underwriter is actually has their job and their livelihood on the hook for this loan. So when you uh -huh. see people and they keep asking you for all this documentation, like, hey, we need this. Hey, we need this, which is, that's why. It's because they're like, if this person does not, if this person doesn't qualify for this mortgage loan or they wind up failing out on this mortgage loan, I'm responsible for it. So wow. they're going to do their due diligence to make sure and ensure that you are a good buyer, a person that's going to actually not default so that they can protect yourselves. And then, you know. You come to the, the the agent and you have a consultation. I always tell people to go in with a strategy. Do not just buy a house because you think it's nice and pretty. You got to base your strategy based off of what's your financial goals within one, two, three, or five years. Because the average buyer stays in a house within eight years. Right. And I try to tell the people to follow the footprint of the city. If you follow how your footprint of the city is going and what's their structures and their comprehension is going, you can kind of align yourself to where so you can build more wealth based off of what city you position yourself in. Wow, okay. So the buying power and strategizing, like that's something that's intriguing to me. Um, and when you say follow the footprint of the city, you're saying like, look at different perspectives that the city has on developing a certain area. That's exactly right. Wow, um, okay. Cause, so like, let's think about it with like the city of Atlanta. Because um, mm -hmm. we're all, we're kind of locally here, so they actually they had it, they originally started the infrastructure project for the Mercedes Benz Stadium on the West End. Mm -hmm. So as they started that project, they started buying areas up and saying, "Hey, we like developers came in and said, hey, we're going to build this over here. We're going to build this hotel over here.' So when you see them build, that's going to affect your property value. Property oh, value is based off of development and everything that everybody positions. So if you follow what the city has in plans in their zoning you can kind of see what's going on in the next within your community. So like I try to tell people, like you can potentially hold out because you know that they're going to convert this area from residential to commercial. You can actually get a payday by holding out as long as you can in order to get the bigger reward instead of you just selling the house really quickly and saying, oh, yeah, I just sold it to the first person that came up because they're going to give you pennies on a dollar. Um, right. It's a, it's a real estate industry. Right. Um, buying power also is more focused in on you know how much money do you have that you can purchase and that's all factored into your debt to income ratio okay. and your credit and income so if you kind of position yourself in the right area you can actually leverage yourself and say okay well i'll buy in this area because there's not a there's there's a huge development process coming up in five to ten years instead right. of me buying it into an area where though the developments now but I know I'm not going to be able to position myself in order for me to get the best leverage. Wow. When I tell you, like, it's so simple, right? But you don't think about stuff like that when you're buying a home because I think you get caught up in your emotions, right? Um, especially if it's your first time buying a home. Like, you're like, man, I've been written all my life. 
and now I want to buy this home. It's going to be all mine. And you get caught up in other things. Like for me personally, um, what was a big deal to me when we moved to the area was the school system, right? And, and so I wanted to make sure that the home we bought was in a good school, not because I was thinking about strategic, like selling later, but I was thinking, I got three kids and I can't afford private school. So, <laughs> so yeah. that was, that was my motivation, but, um, it worked out in my favor because it was a strategic move also because the school systems are so good. Like it actually appreciated the home a little faster. You know what I mean? Um, yep. and so I was like, okay, it's a win-win, but I, I'm so glad that you mentioned that about, you know, looking and seeing like what's in the plans for development, because that is a good strategic move, um, that can definitely transition you from just being a homeowner and into someone who's like a real estate investor. Yeah. I mean, cause that's essentially what you are when you're buying a house, you're, in a right. real, you're really into real estate investing. Um, so I try to, I try to consult my clients as much as possible on what's going on in development, what's going on in cities. And like you said, like even segueing in from the school, like people don't even understand. Sometimes they'd be like, well, you know, the school district is going to, it's horrible. And I'd be like, yeah, that's true. Well, then won't you try to think about it like this? If you could take some of your purchase power and say, how much can I put into, um, to get my child into a private school? That way I could actually get into an area that maybe not be as feasible or, you know, not as great and then kind of evolve myself into, okay, I'm only going to be here for three to five years. How old is my kids right now? Let me transition, maybe turn this into a rental property. And then with the property taxes, if there is a lot of development, you know that the property taxes are going to increase, which is going to improve the school district. That's right. That's right. And every year. Uh, those taxes go up and up and I'm mad, but not really, because like you said, <laughs> it's definitely improving the school um, system, which is why it's like one of the saw after school districts, I guess, in this area. But um, wow, a lot of information. So I'm just going to kind of recap some things. Um, so you share with us about our DTI, right? We understand the importance yes. of that when we're thinking about purchasing a home. Um, you shared with us about our student loans and how that 1% is what they're going to use if you don't have payment plans set up. So Five Finance Family, I hope that y'all were writing down all of these tips because it's going to help you when you're trying to purchase that home. Um, you also shared with us about, um, you know, what our options are. If we don't have stellar credit, what are some things we can do? And the piggyback um, thing was one option. But like Brandon said, Five Finance Family, make sure you're piggybacking on someone who is paying their bills on time, who's doing what they need to be doing so that it helps you. Um, okay, and so, and then you talked about our buying power, power and how to strategically um, invest in real estate in up and coming areas. And so, um, this has been a lot of information, Brandon. Like, again, I got my little notes. I was taking my notes. So if I was looking down, it wasn't that I was ignoring you, but I was trying to make sure I jotted down every single little note for myself so that the next time I make a home um, buying um, or I make a, a purchase of a home, like I can approach it in a more strategic manner. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. I think it's been awesome. Like, great information. Thank you so much. Um, oh, you're welcome. So now I want to see if we have any questions, any comments um, from the Five Finance family. Let's see if we can get Brandon to answer some of those before we log off. All right. So we do have one. Brandon, I don't know if you can see the screen, but I'm going to read it to you. Um, what if I'm buying a home to flip? Should I buy in a low income area or buy in a good area? So it's it's really a, it's based off of your risk assessment. So for a low income area, typically you're not going to probably find high values. But if you can get the property and everything's about the property. So if you can get the property low enough and it makes sense for you to flip it, then, yes, I would I would recommend that you buy um, good areas typically bring more higher demand. So that's typically okay. where you're going to get more into a, a wage of probably overpaying for the asset or um, 
not getting a lot of opportunity or the values are not going to be, I mean, the values will be there, but people don't really want to sell or liquidate those properties. But it's really about your strategy. Um, typically, what I advise people to do is to do three buy, three flips and one hold. So every, every one, one hold, hold you do, every, yep, every flip you do, you should do three and do one hold. That way you can build your capital up so that you can purchase. And, and that way, when you actually do do the acquisition of the hold, you can almost pay the house off completely cash. I try okay. to tell people all the time because a lot of people are like, I don't want to own, I want to own the house outright. And as you being, you know, a, a checks financial person, you know that it doesn't make any sense for you not to keep that net mortgage debt because you can actually right. utilize that as a tax write off. Yes. So <laughs> using those different strategies, see, like it's so important. I'd be like, I don't want to own this asset outright. Why would I? Because right. you can always take the equity out which right. most lenders allow you to take 70 to 80 percent equity out of the house and right. you can use that again to build wealth i can go start a trucking business Absolutely. i can go buy another property i can Absolutely. leverage that money because money makes more sense in my pocket than it does in the bank right and that's literally what you're doing when you're buying a house you're putting money in a bank for a time for when you need to utilize that money so right. when you're thinking about that i think it's 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 important for you to understand as well as if you do go in low income areas, uh, what I would recommend for a lot of individuals to think about is you can actually transition out into affordable housing. You can actually get grant. I mean, the government loves and looks for people to physically give you money to make affordable housing. So you can yeah. actually get paid to utilize that. Also, another uh, tip that I try to tell people is like, you can go on HUD. If you're thinking about positioning yourself in a property, go to HUD.com. They'll actually tell you how much money you can actually get for that area based on how many bedrooms or baths that you can charge for section eight that they will cover and then you can charge an additional fee and the person has to pay that difference that way you got a guaranteed tenant you're always going to make your money and you know exactly the minimum you're going to make from the federal government wow that's amazing and and i love that approach and i love um what you were saying about the um three flips one hole like that's some good sound advice right there revisiting what you were saying about um the tax strategies right like i read somewhere once and this is true like if you have um because you were talking about using the equity in your home in order to um, finance a purchase for your business right and so when you look at it from that aspect um it's almost like good debt versus bad debt right so i read somewhere that if you want something like let's say i want I don't know. Let's say I want the new Tesla S type because that's my car. That's my dream car. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> if I want that and I say, OK, well, I know what that looks like as far as a debt. So let me buy this HUD home, fix it up. Right. Have this income coming in every month to just pay for my Tesla. So exactly. it's th so it's things like that that I've I've learned like okay it's okay to want things right it's okay to acquire things but let's figure out a way to pay for those things where you're not struggling where it's not um, like you said uh, affecting your credit utilization right like we're replacing that bad debt with some good debt <laughs> and yeah so, there you so, go that that's awesome i love it okay cool so we got another question um let's see here how far back do lenders look regarding bank statements and tractions when purchasing a home oh so that's the easy one right so that's uh so banks so when you're thinking about because this is more goals into like investing and if you don't actually have the capital in your bank they're going to look for at least 90. Your, the money has to season in your account for 90 days. So you need to at least let it sit in your account for three months, two to three months for them to allow you to, to use that money. So I always tell people, like, if you're thinking about purchasing and you actually don't have the assets, put it in your bank within two to three months, let it season, and then you can go out and apply for a loan. Okay, let it season. Y'all heard it. Two to three months, you, you said, right? Yeah. Yep, two to three months. And okay. once the seasons, you can actually go out there and acquire with that money and they're not going, it's pretty much no questions asked. It's been sitting on my account. There's no questions asked. 
Wow, I never knew that. See, this is why Five Finance Family, I wanted to bring Brandon on so he can give us all of these inside tips, right? Get y'all ready so y'all could be in the best possible position when y'all go to purchase y'all home because this gives y'all more power at the table. Okay, so <laughs> let's see. Uh, we got another question. What credentials should I look for in a lender? So that's a good one, right? Um, so I try to explain people and lenders when you understand lenders is there's two, typically two types of lenders. You want to kind of, there's the box lenders, which is like your Navy Federal, Bank of America, okay. JP Morgan, those type of banks. They're your box lenders. So they're going to send you, they're going to send your file, submit it into a system. It's going to say yes, no, and that's it. They're not going to work the file. They're not a mortgage originating company. So their business specifically is not into writing loans. That's why they're typically harder to qualify. They look like they like grade A loans because it's easier and it's simpler and they can always sell it mm -hmm. to the sub the subprime market. So when you're thinking about it in a regular mortgage lender, that's what I that's what I call their box lenders. Your out of the box lenders are like your mortgage star, your American Eagle, your USA mortgages. Mm -hmm. Um those are your typical lenders that you want to deal with. Now, every lender, and that's what I try to educate, like I really go to the deep dive of understanding what is the minimum credit score and what's the max, because a lot of people get stuck in the head. Like I heard that you only can buy a house at 620 because some lenders to tell you our minimum is 620. Every lender has an underwriting guideline. So you have to know and understand what their underwriting guidelines are so that you can know how to position yourself. If you already know that I'm a 590, which is FHA is 580, but some banks might say, you know what, I don't deal with 580 credit score. I only deal with 620. Right. So they'll tell you, you can't qualify for a house until you're 620. And then, so some people stop, don't buy because they think that they can't purchase a house. So what your out of the box lenders do, the best ones, they typically look at your file and they'll run the numbers. They're gonna to try to qualify you and see what it would take for you to qualify for that house. So they might tell you, hey, you might got to pull your credit up, you might have to, can you come up with fifteen dollars or $20,000 in down payment? Mm -hmm. Pay off this credit score. I mean, pay off this uh, credit card debt, refinance your car. Those are the steps that good lenders do. Um, so I've been in a position where so I sold for new development. So I had a lot of volume. So I had to kind of steer a lot of customers into actually qualifying for a house because they didn't know. And then my mortgage lender, where I had a great mortgage lender, and he said, hey, this is what you do refinance this car we'll get your car payment down we'll also get you to get some more credit get a gift and then that way we can actually help allow you to purchase your house okay y'all heard that about that gift right now i have heard about this before can Ooh. you just explain to them what you mean when you say get a gift <laughs> okay so a gift is somebody actually giving you funds and is a That's gift right. to you to, right. to to um to pay for to purchase a house now That's right you can get a gift from a church. You can get it from your family member. You can get it from, I mean, your friend. You can get a gift. The thing mm -hmm. the gift is, it's a gift. That's in right. The, in the language, it cannot say that you're repaying the debt. It cannot say that that it, it's a loan. So, I mean, I'm just telling you what the statement has to say. Right. I don't have nothing to do with what you, the bank, and nobody <laughs> else has nothing to do with what y'all agree upon outside right. of the piece of paper. Right. So, Try to get your gifts. Um, churches are great, um, especially I've seen it happen. Whereas though a church is giving somebody five to ten thousand dollars to help close on a house, right? right. It, it, right. You got to use what you can use, right? And, and that's why I wanted you to explain a little bit more about that gift process. So, like he said, y'all, it doesn't matter what was negotiated off the table as long as on the table it's a gift. <laughs> um. So that's some great advice there. Um, okay, so we got another question. Uh, let's see. What's considered a good interest rate for mortgage loans? Now this is this is important, Brandon, because right now I've seen a lot of ebbs and flows. So um, please explain, like what do you think is a good rate? I guess right now. Oh wow. Um, so a good interest rate right now it flexes and i think people always think that there's just a good one and there's never a good one because it's not right changes <laughs> it, it changes it changes day to day it does so a lot of people get caught up in that 
and they'll be okay well i can I, it's 2.5 today well that's if you buy a house physically today that has okay. nothing to do with and what i try to explain to most people is that it takes typically it takes you 30 to 45 days for you for a mortgage loan to actually get approved that you can right. clear to close which is a ctc is that most people use in the term so when you're looking at today's rate that's not going to be a factor 30 days from now right. you can lock in a rate so that you can get the best rate at that time. However, right. you don't know how the interest market's gonna work. So I try to tell people like today, that's a market rate for today. And 90% of people are not closing within a day, seven or 15, they're closing within typically 15 to 30 days. Right. So when you understand that it's kind of like, I mean, a two and a half, three percent is great, but right. is it actually attainable um, is the question because it's really based upon to be honest, is based upon your credit, right? And it's credit is, and it's also based upon like how how you live, like with your DTI, because they're also want to rate you based off your DTI too, right? So and every, the economy also, too, right? To keep it, the economy, because the yep. government dictates the rates. Correct. That's why we got them so cheap right now at this point. Right. They were like astronomically low a few months ago. <laughs> And but I don't know what it is now. Should have refinanced out while you had an opportunity to. I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> yeah. Well, another thing I would try to tell people about credit, especially when you're thinking about looking at mortgage, and I don't want to get people to get caught up on rates, but so after six eighty, every twenty points gets you a different rate variable. After okay. you get to seven forty, they start to give you buyback points and things of that nature. So when you understand, hey, when I get to that top tier credit. That's why you start getting people that they'll start actually like the bank will say, you know what? We can actually give you concessions. Like you want four or five thousand dollars because your credit's so good that right. they can actually sell it off and they don't have to increase it. And right. so the worse your credit score is, that means that it's harder to actually get it. And that's right. why they charge more points or discount points on your credit or your purchases because you're paying for that extra for that rate. And it's all about risk, right? Like, that's what I was sharing with the Five Finance family, like, last week. It's all about risk. Like, the worse your credit is, they see you as a liability because they're like, okay, if he hasn't, he or she hasn't been um, a person that pays their bills on time for the last five years, then why would that change when I now give them a $250,000 mortgage? <laughs> yeah. And so, and I feel like that that's, that's how the banks look at it. And so they're not going to take on that risk at a cost to them. You know what I'm saying? Like you're going to have to pay a premium for them to take on that additional risk. It's no different than investing. It's no different. You, I mean, you put the hammer on the head and that's a lot like a lot of investors look at it is too. Right. Think right. Think about it. Even when you're trying to invest in real estate, they can look right. at risk. Yep. So that's that's some good points. OK, so let's see. We got another question. Um, all right. So is there ever a point where the money overrides your credit score and makes the lenders work with you regardless? Yep, there is. Um, there's a case. <laughs> so <laughs> I've seen it um, typically. They call it typically like a no doc loan um, or like if you put enough money down. So I've seen it where as though they did not care about credit score. Somebody put 50% down because you got to understand that most people only put, and this is average, about 5% down on an right. average. But if you put like 50% down, they already know they have more than enough money to secure the asset to resell it. Right. So you can have shoddy credit. Um, actually, FHA, if you can find a lender, FHA actually qualifies you. Excuse me. The minimum credit score for FHA is 500. So if you want to buy a house through an FHA loan, the minimum credit score is 500. They require 10% down. Wow. So that's, that's just the FYI, just to know, like, <laughs> right. that's why I tell people, like, the minimum is not real. Like, the minimum credit score, if you want to get the lowest down payment, is 580 to 3.5%. But 500 is technically, if you go out here and you Google and you look at it, the minimum and FHA guidelines, if you look at the federal government website, the minimum credit score is 500, 10% down. So wow. yeah, you can get low credit score housing. Right. It's just that you got, you got to factor in your debt to income ratio because they still need to see that you can repay. Right. Um, and that's going to be the major factors, your debt, debt. 
if you got enough capital, they don't care unless you buy it all, you know, all cash. Wow. Right. Right. And, and again, it's about risk, people. I mean, you take they're taking less of a risk if they get most of their money up front. <laughs> so that's some good, good tips, good advice there. All right. So we have another question. Um, so let's see. Is it good to shop around for a lender? And if so, do you shop around or does it hurt? Uh, does it hurt your I can't see the last part of it. Um, your credit. Does it hurt your credit. OK. Yes, it is great to shop around for your your mortgage rates. Um, I always tell people to shop around. So typically, depending on where you're at in the process. So when you're in the process and you have already you're kind of securing your loan, you want to shop around with. I tell everybody a minimum of three lenders. I don't care if you even do business with my lender. You make them work. Um, okay. Because you need to qualify that lender. So there's a fee sheet that they'll typically give out, like you're know, going which you can shop around for what their fees are and things of that nature, as well as your, what your actual um, interest rate is. Mm -hmm. You have to be very specific on when you're talking to interest rates. Some lenders will give you a seven day interest rate. Some might give you a 15 day. Some people might give you a 30 or 45 day. So you need to know when you're, when you're shopping around for lenders, you need to be able to cap, you need to be able to match apples to apples and oranges to oranges. You do not want to be looking at somebody and somebody gives you a seven day um, interest rate and then you're comparing somebody against a 30 day interest rate because I can tell you for sure that seven day interest rate is going to look the best and that's what a lot of lenders try to catch people up on is oh yeah I'm going to give them this low interest rate that I know you can't qualify because you're not going to close in seven days compared okay. to a person I'm going to give you in 30 days right. so shopping around for a lender is great and a little uh, unknown fact is that it does not really affect your credit score it may drop by a point or two but lenders take that off and they already okay. know that you're own. so one thing people don't understand is like people when they go out for consumer because mortgage lenders look at your credit profile totally different than when you're going for a credit card or you're buying a car okay they're, they're they use a totally different system so when you understand that they know that it's only going to be one house you're only going to get qualified for one mortgage loan right whereas though most people when you're buying when you're qualifying for a car you can buy more than one car at a time Right. So that's why it keeps, that's why everybody says they keep hitting my credit. They keep hitting my credit because, yeah, you can get more than one car. But a mortgage loan, the lenders already know we're taking this one off, we're taking this one off because if we actually win, we don't worry about that. So it doesn't wow. affect it. Um, I just try to tell people to make sure that they're very cognizant of it. And you typically want to do it within 30 days um, that's from about your ask. acquisition. Yeah, 30 days from your close to your acquisition. If you can do okay. it sooner and you kind of know an area, always qualify yourself as well um, okay also make sure you look at um oh yeah i was going to hit on the part about you said something about taxes earlier as well mm -hmm. be friends with your realtor fyi if you think your property taxes are too expensive that year your realtor can actually pull the county the, the, the actual sales record within that area within the last 30 to 60 90 days and then you can actually go to your county commissioner and say hey I actually want to fight this. I don't think I should be paying as much insurance taxes. And they'll actually typically just drop the millage rate down for you. So if wow. you want to drop the taxes, that's just a quick tidbit too. Okay, Brandon, me and you should have had this conversation like months ago. But okay, I know now. <laughs> you must have paid the taxes. Yeah, you got to tell you better use this game. <laughs> I had no idea about that. And the funny thing is, um, I have another friend who is a real estate agent and she actually pulled a comp, a comp for me recently um, because I was doing the whole finance thing, right? While the interest rates were low. Um, and so I could see all of that. I could see like the taxes and everything that was paid and um, it looked to be in line. So I don't feel some kind of way about it. But I wish I had known that about, you know, for previous years. Who knows? I probably was paying way too much. I'm sure. Yeah, you can um, always fake. You can always fake some minute. Like, look, I just want a deal. Like, I just want them to get a little cheaper. People do it all the time because I think people be afraid. I've heard people say, you know, I don't want not the me. county to unassess my value. The what the county assess your value as means nothing. Right. It's just what that's their. That's how they utilize their millage rate to calculate their taxes. You should never really care about them because it's not very important. It's about what the market's going to dictate, not what the right. county. Right right exactly yep that's some good advice right there okay i made sure i took that one down i'll be talking to you later brandon 
Um, <laughs> okay, so I think we are done with all of the questions. Thank you so much, Brandon, for hanging around and answering all of those questions. I hope that this has been um, a great, great um, help to my Five Finance family. I saw a lot of hearts, a lot of love. So I think that they were um, all blessed with all the information that you shared with us today, Brandon. Thank you so much. We definitely have to have you back on, if you don't mind, because I feel like you have so much more to share. And I feel like we just scratched the surface. So we definitely um, need to reconnect with you in the future, if if you're open to it. Yes, I would love to come on and um, okay. share some more knowledge. It would be great. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, Five Finance Family, again, um, Brandon, his company is It's Already Sold. Brandon, do you want to tell people how they can connect with you? Yes, so you can check me out at www.itsalreadysold.com. Also, I have a home buyer Zoominar or investor um, Zoominar that's coming out this weekend that we do. I do a Zoominar every month, once a month. That'll be teaching people more about real estate investing and understanding how to invest in real estate from a cycle. So it's once a month, it's Saturday from 11 to 12.30, and you can go into our website, and you'll actually be able to see the link where you can actually subscribe and actually get the Zoom link and check us out. Okay, guys, y'all heard it. Y'all saw all of these good, juicy gems he was sharing with us. So I'm sure there's more to be shared in his seminar. So make sure that you um, guys check him out. Um, and we're also going to post all of this information um, in the last screen when we close out. So thank you again, Brandon. I cannot say enough how um, grateful we are that you spare some time to sit down and share um, all of this great information with the Five Finance family. Again, I know it's going to help them continue to build wealth in their financial literacy journey. Um, so again, Five Finance family, thank you all for tuning in on this edition of Let's Talk Tuesday. Um, until next time, we'll see you later. Bye.